It's that time again where we're going to welcome in Tech Trader for our Trader Talk segment, and that means Sean Udell will be joining me. What's up, Sean? How are you this morning? Good morning, Jim. How are you? I'm good. Well, that's good. Uh, so we've been looking at some of these uh, 5G plays, and they had a very good day yesterday coming out of that G20 meeting, and some of the things got cleared up with China. What is your overall takeaway now that we've we've kind of gotten over the this hurdle um, I feel like there's still maybe some hurdles to go and some volatility left but you know where are you at right now as far as where the 5g plays are as we sit here in uh, the early part of July hold on one sec okay um, well I think I think there's going to be a lot of puts and takes. I think the, you know, first of all, like everybody wants to make something into a single point item. And, and I think what we're going to see over the next couple of quarters is that the, the, all this stuff is a lot more complex, um, you know, than, than, than people want to boil it down to. Like even yesterday, I mean, some, some of the, it, was, it was a great opportunity to actually sell, sell some stuff pre-market yesterday um and and then you know if you want i mean there's a pretty pretty big fade occurring kind of in everything in the market and and in a lot of these names that spike kind of wildly yesterday the the, the most important thing i'm looking at and i'll go back to your, your original question is what have these stocks done let's say in the one to three weeks before the g20 there, there was a pretty good move i mean that that's the thing i think that that people want to, you know, that people haven't been looking at the space or haven't been following the names. I mean, Qualcomm, before the G20, went from 65 to 75. So, you know, people are making it. It's funny. I'm see, seeing, you know, tweeters, people saying, oh, my God, you know, l l look at the fades. Or they gave up all the gains from yesterday. It's, well, are you ignoring the fact that a lot of these stocks went up 20 to 30 percent in the last two weeks? Ba basically since the June, the early June low, right? So, I, so, so one answer to your question is, was the initial reaction, the initial sell-off on the Huawei blacklist too extreme? Yeah, I think, we, I think we've proved that. Um, I think another very, very key point, I wrote this up, is that, is that Micron um, talked very specifically. It was very interesting. They talked very specifically about finding, quote-unquote, legal ways to sell partial product to Huawei. And, uh, well, I don't know if we want to get into that. It's kind of a wonky discussion. But the bottom line, simply put, if you have, if you have a JV that's, that's a China JV entity that's in China, uh, I, I, you know, it probably legally can sell to another Chinese company. Um, so, again, there could be workarounds. There could be blocks. You're also seeing Navarro come out today kind of trying to poo-poo the the amount of business that wow or the amount of product that Huawei is going to be able to buy you know that's probably because they've gotten a lot of heat for caving uh, or so-called caving on caving to China uh, so I have a lot of issues with that we could talk about that but I think the biggest thing is look, look what the stocks have done before the announcement the announcement is a big deal um, because sometimes the bigger deal is in the tone versus the, the details so if the tone is now that, hey, even even if partial sales are allowed to Wowie, that's a huge change from what was previously announced. Um, so th there's a lot here. I mean, there, there really is a lot here, a lot to digest. Here's the, here's the key things, though. That, that here, here's the reason that I, I haven't really needed to waver on anything is that or, or haven't wavered on any, anything with respect to 5G is it, none of this, none of this the issues with China – or the Huawei blacklisting, or any of this stuff changes global end market demand. It doesn't change it. It could elongate the cycle, which actually could be end up being a positive. Because, because I'll, I'll tell you this, I know this for certain. Uh, a, a, an elongated cycle of slower growth will be far, far better for these stocks long term than a really, really hot six quarters. Um, so it, 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 it was 5G cycle is already going to be longer than the 4G cycle anyway by, by, by probably quite a bit, at least a year or so, maybe even two. 
So this probably serves to elongate the cycle. And by the way, we've seen plenty, even last quarter, even last quarter with, with, with some of the cuts and some of the pre-announcements and things, the, the strong part for, mo for most semis were, were, were sales for 5G. Um, that would, in fact, many semiconductor companies, that, that's sort of the only area of growth right now. So if you remember me talking about this like three, four quarters ago, what I said was there's a very good possibility that 5G could be one of the few strong subsectors or subcycles in a world of tech where there's not very many strong cycles and strong areas anymore. Uh, and that was looking out a year or two, and that that's looking that that prediction is probably looking even more likely today. So so boil it all down. One, I think the the the, the issue with China, Huawei, China trade, all this stuff is probably quite a bit more complex than people think. Again, people were thinking, oh, zero zero sales are going to go to Huawei. What did Micron say? Yeah, they actually sold a fair amount of product to Huawei. So, so you know, there's lots of stuff that the other issue is: do do third-party resellers ever come back into the four? In, into the four? I, I think I think long-term that is that's probably going to happen anyway. Now, you're probably going to have companies like, look, what's a long-term to solution to a large customer ever being blacklisted again? We need to have we need to have reseller arrangements. Resellers, tech resellers, were a big deal uh, in the '90s. I, I don't know. A lot of those companies have become bigger and consolidated. Some of those companies basically went private. Um, there was a lot of disruption in that space, uh, basically at the end of the tech bubble. But they st they're still out there. Um, so you know, you might see some of these reseller networks kind of get 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 hooked up and get going again, or you might see you know resellers become a more important uh, component to just global tech sales uh, again. So, so that's something that almost nobody's talked about. Um, I think I'm, I'm the only person I'd, I've ever seen even mention it and, and publish it anywhere. Um, so anyway, we could go on and on and on. The bottom line, um, it, the, the, the tenor just seemed different. So, you know, it seemed kind of more hostile with the China trade stuff before. Now it's kind of open door. They're kind of getting back to where they were before. And um, and here's some some other key things that haven't changed is is the single biggest decision in my view that was made against Huawei was the fact that they're basically restricted from selling network equipment to U.S. network operators. That hasn't changed, um, and that's a that in many ways that's a much harsher decision than than stopping supply of certain components. Because that, that's a direct hit to their long-term revenue multiple or long-term revenue outlook. Uh, and they were a lot, a lot of the cheap, okay, the, anybody kind of was, I'm not, I'm not uh, going to criticize companies that were buying from Huawei in the past but, or, or entities. But really, that, that was probably a poor decision. It's like, okay, look, penny-wise, pound-foolish decision. Uh, can we save a little bit of money instead of buying from Juniper or Cisco or or Comscope or God knows you know any number of these companies Nokia whatever? Oh, can we save a little money and buy from Huawei instead? Yeah, okay, we'll do that. Well, that doesn't look like a very good decision now. And there's other countries kind of taking the same tact. Uh, basically, everybody kind of got sick of Huawei. Huawei's been a bad operator for a long time. I think I talked about the fact that the company's foundation was basically copycatting. Cisco routers and to, to such a degree, to such an exact nature, that they shipped the Cisco operating manual with the router. So, yeah. and that was in the early, early to mid 90s that that was happening. So, uh, I, I think the world kind of collectively got sick of Huawei being a bad operator. So, I think this was all kind of happening. It was kind of a natural progression. And then the issue is, you know, did, 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 did our president maybe go a little too far with the Huawei blacklist? I, I kind of think he did, because it's sort of like if you're if you're going if you're going to go to war with somebody, do you want to give them your key strategy out in the open, you know, or would you rather kind of keep it secret or work behind the scenes? I mean, I don't know. I don't know about, about about winning wars and things like that, but my view would be: look, let let's save the nuclear armaments for later, and let's let's save our best, like let's save our ace in the hole till we really need it. And we kind of put the you know we kind of we kind of put the the <laughs> we kind of threw the nuke first, uh, and, and now we're trying to you know uh, do a little easier fighting if you will. So anyway, th this is all going to work out. 
Um, there's going to be trade to China. Companies are going to find ways to sell product to each other, um, whether directly or indirectly. Uh, and it doesn't change global and market demand. It does change some numbers. I mean, there's no doubt it de definitely changes some numbers. Um, but, but it kind of sets up a situation. I, I think we could have a lot of companies now next quarter to end up beating numbers because numbers have been lowered. A lot of companies cut guides. Analysts really, really cut numbers. So we're probably going to go into a cycle where analysts cut numbers too much and a lot of companies have easier comps. I, I saw, so if, if there's a net conclusion, I think that's the net conclusion. What's the setup and for earnings reports or for a lot of these companies in the next quarter or two? Uh, basically, the bar is easier to jump over than it was before. Yeah, and we saw a lot of that over the last couple of weeks um, with analysts. Uh, 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 an outnumbered pace of downgrades versus upgrades and whatnot. I do have a question, though, regarding some of those tech resellers. What are some of the companies that may be in line to benefit from what you just said? I don't really know because I think, I think I mean, there, there's Aero, there's Avnet, there, but, but again, you can't. You can't just sell. Well, I guess you could. You could sell to a, re, a U.S. reseller, and then and then the liability is on them, right? Um, the, the key is it's got to pass through enough through through sort of enough hands that it becomes hard to track. Um, so you know who knows? But yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I'm not uh, that that was a big part of tech. There was a company called Black Box that was a really really hot. I don't even know if they still trade. I, I don't. Some of these companies, there's been a lot of changes in the space. I think Black Box was bought out. It was either it was either taken private or bought out. Um, but there were there were a lot of hot, uh, basically technology warehouses, technology resellers. Um, maybe CDC is still around, Computer Data Center, Computer Data Warehouse, whatever, CDW. Um, but Aero and Avnet are, I think Avnet's one of the bigger ones. Um, so, but yeah, I'm not sure. My guess is the, the, the ones who would probably benefit more are probably a little smaller under the radar, have lots of tentacles, and are private companies. That would be my guess. The, the big publicly traded guys probably have to be a little more careful. Um, but same thing. I mean, they, you know, they, they, they could buy them. They could sell to somebody who's, who is quote unquote friendly and what that person does with the product after they, they sell to a legit buyer, it, it, they, it's out of their hands. Right. So yeah, I don't, I don't really know on that. I mean, if, but put it this way, if this were to go on a lot longer, I, I haven't done a lot of wait, not saying wasted time, but spent much time researching this yet. Because I pretty much think this this whole China thing is is it is what it is. I mean, this was this is either going to turn out to be a really really coy and smart negotiating tactic using Huawei and China and China tariffs and things like that for trading, get hardballing trade negotiations. It's it's either going to prove to be a super super brilliant negotiating tactic, or it's going to prove to be, you know, maybe they could have accomplished the same thing without it, right? Uh, maybe it just sort of elongated something. But, I mean, at the end of the day, th this, this is why, put it this way, I'm not going to change long-term numbers. I'm not going to change long-term multiples. I'm not going to change long-term price targets on short-term political things. I'm just not going to do it. A lot of analysts are going to do it, and they have. They spent a ton of time spinning wheels, changing numbers. And, yeah, numbers, are, numbers might change a lot for a quarter or two. But over one or two or three years, I don't think the number is going to change very much. I, ultimately, I think... This global supply chain that we have we have created in tech is incredibly vast and incredibly complex, and by the way, incredibly efficient. I mean, uh, you know, I, I want markets to work. So, so you know, whether you know whether somebody is a Trump fan or not, or whether somebody is a fan of the GOP or a fan of the Democrats. Here, here's my issue. Any party that tr that is it basically is practicing a little too much government intrusion and not letting market forces work, I'm I'm going to disagree with that. And so, so my view is the, the here's the thing: the market's going to find a way. It's, it's going to find a way. Um, and you know, again, these other things are going to block and delay, but they're not going to ultimately really change anything. I don't think. So, you know, the, the, this, I, the, I think this whole period is, could, could end up being kind of a good lesson for everybody. 
um, over time because uh, I, I don't know, man. It's been a long time since we had to really worry about political stuff on the front burner for tech. Um, now, there's been some legitimate issues. I think I think a more legitimate issue would be things like DOJ actions against Google and Amazon and stuff like that. That could be very long lasting and very and very. Um, uh, sort of course changing for, for those companies, um, just as it was for Microsoft for a very long time. But I, th I think anything that we can kind of boil into a broader trade negotiation, I think it did, the deal also ultimately gets cut. And, um, and so we'll just, we'll just kind of you know, go, go from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, like I say, I, I don't think global end up market demand going to changes, but obviously some stuff that was going to be done and shipped and built, uh, for the last, let's say quarter or so has been delayed. And, and, you know, I mean, it has, does have some lasting, I mean, MTSI has been a case in point company. They've had some pretty lasting impacts. I mean, it, I mean when did China trade start or the trade issues? I mean, this has been, this is roughly Q4 of this now. Um, maybe even a little longer, but, but it's for sure Q4. And there have been a fair number of companies that are missing anywhere from five to sort of 20% of their business for more than a quarter or two. It's probably, probably not five quarters, but it's probably two to two to four quarters somewhere in that, in that range. So again, it's, it's not like you can't ignore it, but you have to use it as, as at least I'm using it as a, sort of an opportunity. And the, the question is, how do you wait? How long do you wait? What do you do from a timing perspective? Things like that. But, but the biggest change to me has sort of been happening really since the China blacklisting, the lows that a lot of stocks made, and then that's the subsequent kind of healing. And most of that healing of many of these companies and charts has occurred basically into further bad news. I mean, look how light's done even while they've had a pretty material guidance cut. Uh, and that stock was 57.50 yesterday morning, and I was buying some as low as the low, low 41s. So, you know, that's, just, that's a case in point of a really good example of a stock that overshot a bunch of them, a bunch of the other ones did. Um, I'm kind of looking at Acacia right here, right now. Uh, pretty big fade. Again, I'm not sure who was buying that at 54 and change yesterday morning, 54.50, you know, maybe a desperate short that had a cover. But at the same time, you know, I, I really think that stock should have been up because should it have been, been down? I mean, this is a company that has, has, has posted and put out a press release that I think their Huawei exposure is something like one, it's de minimis, de minimis. it's like 1%. And yet that stock's been hit as hard as anything um, with like, uh, I mean, light, light has 12, 14% Wowie exposure. And I'm pretty sure the net, the net percent decline in Acacia is probably about similar. <laughs> so, so that's the other thing too, that there's, that's why I talked, there's so many complexities and layers here because some of the stocks have gone down a lot, uh, haven't really had much Wowie exposure. Um, it, it basically the market has kind of treated all these names the same, whether they've got, 5% exposure, 1% exposure, 14% exposure. They've all, they've all pretty much been treated the same, um, except Neon Photonics, which is 45% exposure. That, that is a real, you know, there is a real threat to long-term viability. I'm not sure the odds of that threat to long-term viability, but that, hey, that's a spooky thing for them. If, if, they, if they lose 45% of their sales, to, they basically they lose their biggest customer can they maintain the business? I'm not, you know, hey, I don't know. That, that, that's a spooky one. Again, ultimately think that, that they probably end up getting a lot of their sales restored. But they're, hey, they're, 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 one, they're one company that's, that's white-knuckling it through this period. I'm sure they're, it's very uncomfortable for them. Uh, and I feel for them because they, they were poised to have a really good cycle. I mean, that's the, the biggest unfortunate thing for them is they have the right products, the right time. They plan for this very well. Um, they've been very good. I mean, hey, they haven't had their IP stolen. They've been they've been a big seller to Huawei pretty much in the the, the entirety of the company's existence, and they've have a very good working relationship with the company. And again, as far as I know, Huawei hasn't uh, you know hasn't pulled a fast one, you know. And, and 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 I think in a lot of ways, I'm not saying Huawei is a great operator right now. Um, there was some guy on CNBC just today that won a suit against them. But I do think Huawei has been more friendly, stealing. I mean, I think they just had to get better over time. 
I think and then they lost that Cisco suit many years ago. I, I think they've been a better operator since since they lost the Cisco suit. Again, that doesn't mean they've been perfect. Um, but again, market forces work. If you let the market forces work, I mean, hey, if the tech world collectively knows that dealing with Huawei is dangerous, guess what? They quit dealing with Huawei or they take different precautions when dealing with Huawei. So, you know, a lot of this stuff has kind of been known. Companies have been dealing with this for a long time. But again, I, I haven't wavered. I'm very bullish on 5G, very, very bullish on the purveyors of 5G, the providers of 5G enabling technologies. I think it's going to be a big deal for IoT. I think it's going to be a big deal for driverless automation. Uh, might even be a bigger deal for robotics. I'm starting to look at some robotics uh, type things now. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I think anybody that sort of thinks that, uh, and I've heard this said, oh geez, the 5G trade's dead now. Eh, that's just a lunatic. That's a that, that's an idiotic comment in my view. So, um, you know, but there's a lot of that. There's a lot of idiotic comments being spread around for all sorts of reasons right now. The market's still in a crazy spot. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I think I think if this is a step in the right direction. It's definitely not a panacea. I, hey, we don't have a deal. Until we have a deal, the deal is not done. The full sales to Huawei are definitely not restored. Um, but the tone's better. The texture's better. You know, they're talking again. Some sales are being restored. And again, it'll be very interesting to see how many other companies come out like Micron. I mean, that, that's probably the thing I'm most interested in. How many more Microns do we have out there that talk about that they didn't lose 100% of their sales to Huawei? They did find ways to sell legal, legitimate product to Huawei. Um, and by the way, you know, for a lot of these companies, Huawei is not their biggest customer. So, so that's the other thing too. It's like, how much has been made of something that's really not maybe a, a massive deal? Again, a massive deal to Neon Photonics. I would say if you got 10, 12 percent exposure, it's material, but it's not. It's not life altering for these companies. So, you know, it, the, the market loves to pick on things and make a bigger deal of something than there is. I think that's what this whole thing ultimately is going to boil down to. I think people will be pretty surprised where a lot of these 5G stocks are trading in four to six quarters from now. All right. So speaking of, uh, what ones do you think still have some opportunity here? I know you had talked about taking some profits in some of these names, but... Um, we did get a nice little pullback. So is there one that you're thinking about reloading outside of Acacia? Um, the, one I'm probably most interested in uh, that we haven't talked about a whole lot is Comscope. Um, I think I've written a few notes on it. Um, but it's, you know, the, the biggest issue with there with them is, is they, they were prob they had 5G product and they have 5G exposure just as they had 4G exposure but they needed to, they, they felt that was a weakness for the company. So they went out and they bought Eris. They paid about seven, seven billion for Eris. Eris doubled their revenue base. So, so Comscope was a company of about four and a half, five billion in revenue before. Now it's a company of, uh, on, a, on a forward basis, uh, 10 to 11 billion in revenue now. Um, and a funny thing's happened. Comscope's market cap hasn't gone up at all. Um, in fact, it's gone down. Uh, the stock was sort of a 22 to a 27 dollar stock. It was as high as 42 before the Eris acquisition was ever announced. And oh, by the way, um, so they basically doubled their revenue base. Uh, yeah, they took on some debt, but they they managed debt. Um, Eris was a company that traded for a very strong, solid company for decades. So Eris never had a problem managing their debt and produced plenty, plenty of cash flow. So the bottom line, this is just one of those weird things. You, you have Comscope, which has gotten absolutely zero benefit from doubling their revenue base on an acquisition. The, all the market count has done has gone down. Again, this is the typical people believing that a lower stock price means it's the worst company. <laughs> and, and so in my view, uh, I think Comscope is really incredible opportunity. I, and I think there's a lot of those right now. It's it's uh, we're, we're a weird market. I mean, it's it's Comscope is another one of these companies is basically the antithesis of something like a Roku or a TTD or a Mongo or something like that. The momentum stocks that go ever higher, the valuation doesn't matter because maybe they beat earnings by four million another quarter. So the, they beat earnings by four million. They guide three million higher. 
that collective seven million dollars in revenue adds another eight billion dollars of market cap to the stock, or two billion, or four billion, or whatever. But yeah, you get seven seven million in revenue beat equates to billions in revenue or billions in market cap of upside. It's completely nonsensical. So, you know, the valuation of Comscope is probably nonsensical. However, will the company see a benefit from the deal until they have some kind of a positive catalyst? Because in the absence of buyers, uh, the machines push stocks ever lower. The, the machines don't seem to care about fundamentals at all. Uh, I think they used to. I think algorithmic programs were kind of programmed with certain fundamental discipline, if you will, in the early days. See, that discipline seems to have gone out the window. And now it's just there. they worship the altar of being able to take whatever micro pennies on whatever trades that they're able to, to, uh, to get in front of. And so uh, cheap stocks go cheaper, expensive stocks get more expensive until something breaks. So I think Comscope, you know, I'm very content to kind of nibble away at some here and there. I think the, the value is pretty incredible. Doesn't mean it can go to 12, which would be a more incredible value. But hey, I liked a, a stock I liked at roughly 0.7 to one time sales. Um, and, uh, you know, this was a pretty nice name for me, I think, earlier this year. Um, caught a pretty good move from it from, you know, the December into March, April. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, if, if I like a stock at 0.75 or 0.8 times sales, it's already a pretty incredible price. At 0.3 times sales, I basically double the revenue base, double the cash flow. Debt management issues are basically the same. I'm going to like the name. So I have, have no idea of where a name like this can bottom because the market's crazy. Um, but you know, something, something like this is pretty, is pretty intriguing to me. Um, so, so that would be one, I mean, I've, I've talked about DICOM before. DICOM's chart's pretty good. You know, that was another one of these really crazy, weird, severe reactions. You know, stock went from, I think something like 80 to, uh, 40, or maybe, maybe it was high sixties to, to 40 in a day on an earnings miss that really wasn't that bad of a deal. Um, and oh, by the way, look, uh, they basically filled the gap. They're almost back to 60 now. So, you know, uh, that's still a very cheap stock. Um, but most of the names are the same names I've talked about many times. Um, there's not much new in the space I haven't discussed quite a bit. It's really just sort of looking at the group of names and kind of seeing, okay, is there any, ex is there any exceptional name that for some reason is, is you know, is trading at a, at a big discount to the rest of them. I'm still, still like MTSI just as much as I did before. Uh, I mean, MTSI is almost, again, worth a couple, a couple seconds of discussion just on the fact that of any company has probably bit the bullet and kind of put some news out there was that it's kind of as bad as anybody. Kind of related to everything. Huawei, China, CEO, how, you know, you name it. CEO basically being forced to resign or getting fired or whatever. I, I can't remember the whole deal on that. But new CEO, um, that stock has acted very well. And, you know, and I don't think you can just put it all in the back that, oh, the new CEO came in by a million dollars in stock. I, I think, again, I think things are a little more complex. I think pe people that understand this company know what kind of revenue, revenue they can produce in the future when things get settled. I think they know what kind of 5G portfolio they have. Uh, this is one, too. Again, I do not want this company to get bought out. You probably remember saying the same thing about Finisar. This is probably the name I worry about most of that it succumbs to a buyout. No, Dicom? hey, it, it, we're, we're talking about MTSI. Dicom. Oh, MTSI. MTSI, MTSI uh, because I know the buyout would not – it'd be like Finisar. It, it'd be okay, and it'd be a good pop from the current price. Um, but it, but it would not be anywhere close to where, where I think the, you know, the terminal value of the company is. And, um, but I don't know, I'm, I'm literally worried that they're going to sell themselves and, but, but therefore, you know, uh, that could be a short term catalyst. We'll see. I, I just have this weird feeling. I kind of had that same thing with, with Finisar. Um, you know, I was literally worried that, that, that Finisar was going to get bought out and it did. And, uh, you know, that'll ultimately end up, again, the value of that will ultimately be translated to 2.6. But it, it elongates, I, I think, I think Finisar would have had a really good run on their own already uh, and surpassed the, the, the buyout price with ease. Um, 
So anyway, we'll we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, most of the names are the same. I mean, I mean the one name. I mean, I guess everybody should just keep on their radar. Um, I, I don't I don't like talking about penny stocks a whole lot or stocks that you know under five bucks. But but I mean, Neon Photonics is a legitimate company. It's been around for a while. If if you get a clear resolution, a China trade deal and clear resolution on Huawei, well then then they're you know the worrying about death for Neon Photonics goes off the table so so that one's faded a lot too off of yesterday's highs and that kind of makes sense because anybody thinking that a hundred percent of Huawei sales is going to be restored day one is, was was not thinking very clearly um, so but you know put it this way if there's if there's two names that I will definitely look it depends how much they pop of course but two names that I'm keeping on the radar the day that we get a deal a China deal or a deal with uh, resolves Huawei is AMBA and and uh, Neon Photonics. Um, AMBA is more of a read. Be but well, hold on. AMBA is more of a read between the lines issue. Neon Photonics does like look okay, so they're not going to lose forty five percent of their sales now. <laughs> so so then you got to go back and say okay, what's the company? What was the company worth before? Because because it won't go back to where it was trading before. Not even close. You know it'll pop like like you know it'll pop a buck. Well, if it used to trade at eight and it pops a buck, you can still buy it at five sixty. You know what I mean? So, AMBA is more of a read between the lines. I mean, they they have some big Chinese customers that you know were supposedly, you know, in the crosshairs of a potential blacklisting. So there's been a lot of issues now. Uh, that's roughly, I think, fifteen to twenty five percent of their sales. So you know, that's something you got to be a little wary of. But again, you get a clean deal, clean resolution. You know, AMBA was really, really, I mean, AMBA was already in a hot, uh, like, uh, it was basically a Momo trade. Uh, but it was an early, cheaper Momo trade. Those are like, those are the ones I like to play. And then the, all this China trade war stuff has, has kind of killed the AMBA trade. Um, anyway, what were we going to say, Jim? Well, I was just thinking about the type of moves that would happen if, uh, you know, a deal like that got announced. Neo Photonics just yesterday, I mean, this thing spiked from, it was trading 430 and traded, you know, a whole, a whole dollar higher. Would you be willing to chase it? Because you got to think well, about a, a pure China deal would make this stock, I don't know. And and you got you to gotta sense that they would probably be front running that too. I would you will see that's the thing. So so a lot like again the big biggest reason why light isn't up more is because light already went from forty one to fifty three before 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 any China news, right? So so you know yeah uh, you know fifty seven fifty pre market okay see you later right? But but the bottom line is hey it's still holding pretty good. It's fifty four. I mean this stock could trade a lot higher over time. I mean this this is the stock that I mean again my price I can't. Uh, what, what was my here? Let me look. Uh, my my last target on this was uh, eighty eighty five ish, right? So, you know, it's it's you know this thing this thing has a lot of room. Um, but but yeah, neon photonics, I kind of I kind of said that. Let me let me read. So let let's say the stock pops to five to to five sixty five seventy on a firm deal. We, we you have to just see how much of it. Hey, if it pops straight back to 780, it's probably not a trade, right? However, they they were set up to to really get a lot of sales. Their cycle was was really well positioned before. I, I'd also mention that in a world where most of their compatriots and a lot of the chip companies and things had already, I mean, companies had already been guiding lower before well, Huawei was blacklisted. That's been, I mean, the semiconductor space has been, I mean, how many times has, has NVIDIA guided lower? Way, way before, you know, a, a, any stuff with Huawei. I mean, they, they, they've been guiding lower since, like, I think the Q3 or Q4 of last year. So, but, but Neon Photonics ha, it was, is one of the companies that had not guided lower. They, they basically had met quarters. In fact, I think one or two quarters of the last three they modestly guided higher. I think last quarter they modestly guided higher. So uh, you just have to see. So so let let's say if it, if it pops to 560, 575, and kind of holds and doesn't keep going, I'm probably a buyer of 560 on a, on a China deal. Uh, if if it pops to 750, I, I'm I'm probably more of a seller. Uh, I'm not a buyer because you know I mean where was the stock high sixes to kind of low eights before. Um, 
and, and again, everything's not going to get fixed on day one. Um, even on a deal, even on a resolution of a deal, there still might be some, some handcuffs and things like that. But yeah, I mean, if the thing pops a buck, I'm going to say my, you know, my, my, I, my idea is going to be, Hey, I'm willing to buy it at 560 to 575 because I think the stock's worth eight or nine bucks again, pretty easily. You know, if it pops to 750, then uh, there's not much room to eight anymore. Um, so the, the reason I mentioned Acacia earlier is because, again, this Acacia has just been this weird trade that it's basically, at, it's basically traded like one of the 15% exposed names, even though it's 1% 1, 1 exposed. Now, I know enough to know that they were also set up to probably get a pretty good Chinese burst, if you will. I don't know if that would have been sales to Wowie. It would have more been sales into the largest telecom operators now, does that translate, does that mean it goes through Huawei and ZTE first before it ends up at China Telecom uh, or China Unicom or whatever? Or does it, are there sales straight to the Chinese vendors? I, I honestly don't know. Um, but the bottom line is uh, there could be some legitimate fears that the Huawei blacklist either delays or crimps some of those Acacia Chinese sales that were, were they're, they're still set. I mean, they're still... They're still in the mix for those, but but you know, does that potentially hurt that? That that was going to be a short term kind of a two three quarter burst, but it was going to be a nice chunk of revenue. Um, you know, to me, the acacia story is really it's the anti acacia story of when I was negative on the stock, where they had uh, something like sixty to eighty percent of their exposure or sales were to ZTE. And so the big bear case on the stock, and I, this might have been pre-briefing time for me, but the big bear case on Acacia at 120 bucks, and I was I did short it then, was that look they they have a major diversification issue, and i.e. they have no diversification. They're banking on uh, a, a very very heavy weight in sales to ZTE, and Acacia has done a very very good job of diversifying their revenue base, and ZTE is not even one of their top. If I, it's a top 10 customer, it's 10% 10, 10 customer. I, I don't think uh, ZTE is even the top five for them anymore. It may be, it may be. But, you know, so what's Acacia done? They, they've basically gone from 80% China. And by the way, what wasn't ZTE was other China sales. So they've gone from 85% 80 China sales to probably 15% China sales in like uh, two years. I mean, it's been amazing uh, and what, what's happened is they just won a lot of business. They've won business the U.S., Europe, Canada, you name it. So, um, but that, that, that is a weird, of all the sell-offs that we've had, that 60, maybe it was a smidge hot at 60, but not really. I mean, that's just a weird sell-off, 60 to 45 with 1% wow exposure. Again, market's weird. It, it, a lot of these companies, they get these low, they go into this, what I call buyer strike phases. So they go into a buyer strike. There's nobody really buying them. They just get beat on. The machines just sell them every day. Um, in the absence of in the absence of institutional buy sides uh, buying, um, you know the stocks get machined lower. It's just the way of the world now. It's the way the algos work. So uh, you have to be aware of that when you're when you're accumulating these positions, and you have to be aware of what happens on the other side when those these stocks finally start getting bought. They go up huge. What which is like what Acacia did yesterday. So. Um, but yeah, as far as other ones, it, it, probably the only new one, or and it's not really new because I've talked about it, but the only one that I, I would say I'm highlighting that I haven't talked about and written volumes about would, would probably be Comscope. I, I just think it's such an exceptionally stupid valuation right now. But that doesn't mean it can't get more stupid. But it's just, it's uh, like I would say my odds of making money on Comscope are like very high. Um, that does, doesn't mean I won't eat 10 or 15% before making a lot, but, and, and I think the eventual return is very high as well. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it, I don't know if it gets back to old highs. I don't know if it surpasses those highs. Um, but I do know the stock could double and still be one of the cheaper stocks in my universe in this space. All right. And before we let you go, you had some commentary about what you thought the about Fed? the Fed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that's still, you know, again, I, I, I don't really love the market. I, there, there's a lot, there's, it's a great market to accumulate cheap positions and then, and then wait, wait to get paid on them. 
But as far as, you know, we, we still have a cloud bubble. I mean, that, that hasn't been resolved at all. Uh, you know, we still have at least a mini, a mini IPO froth or mini IPO bubble. Um, again, there really hasn't been that many IPOs that are just crazily valued. I mean, I, I, maybe, maybe five. I mean, Crowd, Beyond, um, Pager Duty. I mean, it, you know, there's, there's a few. Um, you know, I haven't looked at the real, real a whole lot, but I, I don't think that was exorbitantly overvalued. Again, I don't, I don't think Slack, I don't think Slack's exorbitantly overvalued. It's expensive, but, but I, I think it's a lot more worth that valuation than, than Pager Duty and, and, oh, Zoom. Zoom is the other one. And Zoom. Um, uh, so, so the problem is we, there's still issues. We, we don't have, there's, no, there's just no rationality in the market. Um, and, and so, and that's on both sides. You, you have incredibly irrational prices on really, really cheap stocks. You have incredibly ir irrational stocks and really expensive stocks, but the expensive stocks are the ones that have driven the market. So to the degree that the market is banking on Fed cuts to hold and or go higher, I think that's, a, again, I, I, to me, that's just kind of a lunatic thing. Could, could the Fed cut like take one of their cuts back or something or a couple, I suppose. But the, I, I, it, it's almost better for the Fed just to leave the bullets in the gun and just jawbone and just and just say you're and say you're dovish, and say you're you know you'll 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 cut if needed or something, and and you know maybe they do a token a token twenty five basis points or something. But again, I keep I keep unless it's being misreported, it seems like there's a hundred percent odds of seventy five basis points. Of Fed rate cuts. I, I just don't see any way that happens. I, I, I could be wrong, um, you know, uh, so, but I, to, to me, I, I would not, if, if I felt, if this was me, if I was an index player, which I'm not, but if I was an index player and my whole premise was that I'm still, I'm still long indices because I'm banking on the Fed to cut 75 basis points, I would immediately go to 100% cash. That, that, that would be my view <laughs> because, because I don't believe that the Fed is going to cut by 75 basis points. So now how much of this is hyperbolic? How much of this is media type stuff? You know, uh, I, I personally don't know if the market is solely hanging on to its, its valuation because of uh, hopes that the Fed's going to cut 75 bips. I, 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 you know, but there's some of some of that has to be into the market. So I would just chalk that up as again a, another thing to be aware of and be cautious of, and it, it's probably a suppressor to the market. So I think the best I think the best case for the market is kind of what we've talked about, where you know the hot stuff cools very meaningfully, the cold stuff gets warmer to hot, we get a rotation. There's plenty. There's, in fact, this may be a market where we, we may have more room for rotation since any market since 2013. And in some ways, I think this market has a lot more room for rotation than even 2013 did. So the 2013 setup, just to, re, just to back up, was uh, it was all about Apple the year before. And it really was. Now, it was also all about Netflix and a few other names. But it was a mega cap rally. Uh, it was largely out driven by Apple. Apple started having bad prints and was forgiven for them. Hello? Yep, still here. Oh, just 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 want to make make sure I I, I didn't lose you. Um, but um, so so the bottom line is is we so what had gotten left behind? Small cap, mid cap growth and value were exceedingly cheap. Can't remember the oil space. I think oils were okay back then. Biotechs were exceedingly cheap. Bottom line, the whole bear thesis, which was very strong and prevalent at the end of 2012, was there was nowhere for stocks to go except down. Because Apple was Apple, the leader was dead, the leader was going down. And, and this was still when Apple was, was 550, you know, it didn't bottom until 382. And so, um, but what happened? The money found lovely cheap stocks to go into. And, um, you know, it, it, it found them with ease and the money rotated in 2013 ended up being a whopper of year. It did help that Apple bottomed and then ended up going up a lot. Um, but the whole time Apple was going down, the indices didn't really lose that much. They lost, they lost a little, but they didn't really lose that much. Um, 
So, you know, it ended up being a very interesting interesting mix. Um, and I kind of think we have the same setup again. I, I, you know, it doesn't mean we can't have a harsher correction and things like that. Um, but, yeah, I, I think we have the same. But the, the, the amount of stocks that could, that could find market cap come to them is exceedingly high. And it includes a lot more than tech. It's cheap tech. It's oil. It's pretty much the energy space. It's the finance space. It's all sorts of stuff. All right. Well, you know what, Tech T, I think we covered a lot on this 5G today. And, you know, we had some fireworks on yesterday and coming out of that, uh, what we called the truce, I guess, with China. And on the horizon, we got earnings season. So next week, we'll probably dabble into that as far as uh, what you've seen, as far as what analysts have baked into their numbers now i'm sure you're going to do a lot of research over the weekend if you're you know not taking a break from from this maybe it is your calm before the storm yeah no this has been a this has been a pretty relaxing period i mean i you know uh i'm, I'm getting refreshed and recharged for I, I think this could be a much more interesting quarter than the last couple have been I, I i don't think you can just put it this way i don't think this is a quarter where oh hey it beat therefore it's going higher I mean, you know, the, the, that's a lunatic trade that has to end. Just because a company beats doesn't mean the stock should keep going up. I mean, at some point, valuation does matter. You know, at some point, second derivative rates of growth matter. And so, you know, we'll just see what happens. But, yeah, I, I think a lot of that stuff will come back. I think this is a, a interesting interesting setup. All right. Sounds good. Well, as always. Although I still think it's two weeks away. I don't really think there's much in the earnings docket next week. Well, we got um... – I think the the banks begin next oh, week. Oh, there you go. So, yeah, I, yeah. For me, it's about two weeks away. Yeah, well, you know, we like to stay ahead of the game, so. Of course, of course. All right, well, hey, have a great fourth. You too, my man. We'll talk next week. Okay, you bet. Bye. All right.